are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Fire University. We have another episode of Turkey Week. And I'm really excited. We get tons of questions from people out there, you, the listeners, about uh, opportunities to get help with prescribed burning, whether you're trying to develop knowledge or you want someone else to to help you get it done. Uh, And we've had a variety of specialists in those areas. And today we had Ted DeVos, who's with Bakken DeVos Forestry and Wildlife Services. And Ted, I'm really excited to have you. I'm thankful that you came on the show. I know you have a ton of experience with prescribed fire and also working with a lot of these landowners that that uh, would like a little help. Absolutely. Enjoyed yeah. uh, coming on. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be a real fun conversation anyway. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to get right to the the matter of interest. So we are part of Turkey Week. I know that you have a, a strong interest in turkeys and and uh, you have a ton of experience with, with managing quail populations and research related to quail and obviously a lot of, of, uh, of interest in helping people get their burning done. So uh, I guess the, the first thing that I wanted to lead into is what when you're working with with landowners, you, they contact you and and have you come out, and they're interested in forestry and wildlife management. I presume a lot of the time, both. Uh, what what are the things I guess that that are the initial barriers or that the things that are initially need to be addressed most often when you're when you enter that that uh, that realm? Yeah, that's obviously a, a broad. Uh, question. There's so many different answers to it, depending on you know where they're at and who they are, and but sure. that's kind of what what we try and do when we first you know initially meet up with a landowner, mm-hmm. um, and they're looking for some type of advice on you know uh, management of their land. It's going to be timber oriented or wildlife oriented, and that's kind of what we got to pick out. Most mm-hmm. of these landowners they they, they kind of have an idea of what they're looking for. They don't know how to get there. And so we spend our first few hours, you know, looking at their property, um, not only trying to evaluate what what's on the property, but, you know, what their real objectives are. And yeah. sometimes that can be complicated to pick out of a landowner's head because a lot of times they're not sure. Well, I want mm-hmm. bigger deer or I want more turkeys. You know, well, that's, you know, a, a good uh, answer to a, to a really complex question. Sure. And um, so. Um, and then there's the tolerance levels. So I've, you know, had landowners, for instance, that, you know, as well, I want to have, you know, more quail on a place and, mm-hmm. uh, you drive around looking at it and it's a, you know, they burn, uh, but it's a, you know, hundred basal area of pine stand. that's completely shaded on the ground. And you're like, well, you got to cut timber. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I don't want to cut any timber. I like the way my place looks. Yeah. So, well, well, then, well, then you don't you want can't quail. Have any quail. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so that that's the biggest thing is to try and figure out, you know, what they what their interest is, what their tolerance levels for different activities, whether it be burning or thinning mm-hmm. timber and things like that. And then what's available for you to reach those objectives on their property. So, you know, they have primarily primarily pine stands. Is it hardwoods? Is it, uh, you know, sure. mixed up? A uh, variety of stand ages and stand species, um, mm-hmm. you know, trying to figure all that stuff out. And then, you know, we'll spend some time 
on a computer doing some mapping work and stand building stand maps and things like that and try and you know get our head wrapped around where does fire fit into all this and sure. you know how do we use that to to help get to where this guy wants to go that's kind of the big thing about mm-hmm. first steps with these guys so when they when when you're initially meeting with landowners is it pretty typical that they their decision making is being driven by wildlife objectives or would you say that it's by forestry objectives or both no. it varies you know we kind of hit a niche um uh, i think and, and with reason um you know my background was tall timbers research station back in mm-hmm. the in the 80s and um, learning about burning and quail and stuff like that did a lot of quail research through auburn uh, mm-hmm. with the albany project stuff like that and um I got a forestry and a wildlife degree uh, both and so you know that's kind of the realm i was headed towards anyway my partner was more or less straight forestry and when i got in montgomery here uh, we spent some time working together uh, but he was doing timber management oriented stuff and worked for some uh, timber companies buying some timber things like that but he was really interested in the management aspect of it and so we kind of partnered up and that that niche of people that we kind of searched out was that recreational landowner that um, wanted to do a little bit of both because that's kind of where we felt like we specialized in you know how Mm -hmm. do you integrate timber management and wildlife management together and so you know i would say our base runs from guys that are 100 percent quail uh for instance that really the timber is is so far down the list uh they don't want to waste money on their timber so we're you know we're cutting timber Mm -hmm. and obviously trying to make money off it but they also um uh, want to have optimal habitat. So that may mean, you know, first thinning on a pine plantation cuts it back to what a forester would call you crazy for doing, cut mm-hmm. back to hundred trees per acre, you yeah. know, something like that, which would be a waste of timber in essence, but it gets the landowner's objective for habitat uh, faster to where he wants to be. Mm-hmm. And so it runs from that guy all the way to, we've got some clients that are like, look, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm primarily want to generate income off my property. I bought this thing to, you know, make some money on it. I want to hunt and because every one of our clients, and I think in just about every case, you know, does utilize the recreational aspect of the property. Mm-hmm. But um, we don't have very few lease, you know, people that own their property for timber management and then lease the hunting rights out, for instance. Most of these guys are hunting on their properties and they want to enjoy it. But, you know, some of them have been uh, focused more, way more on the timber side. I would say, you know, 80% of our guys lean heavily on the wildlife side though. Um, and the, and the timber guys, it's kind of funny because, um, we had one of our clients that bought a couple thousand acres of old IP property in Ash paper company. Mm-hmm. And so it was in industrial pine plantations and fairly large blocks. And, um, um, we talked about what to do and he was fine with doing, you know, some rotational burning and, doing some herbicide work to take care of sweet gums and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it didn't take, but a couple of years and all of a sudden, you know, the deer and turkeys were really good on the place. And he was like, I might want to lean a little bit more on the wildlife side. And, you know, how do we, uh, how do we kind of, you know, push our, our property more towards benefiting the deer and turkeys and, and maybe even some quail and not so much on the timber side. So, you know, their, their objectives even change over time, especially when they see results from something simple like burning and doing a little bit of herbicide work. Sure. Yeah. That, that was uh, what I started thinking about while you were talking right then is I wonder, I was wondering how often people start with an objective maybe related to timber and, and they start to see the benefits with the, yep. uh, their, their recreational hunting species of interest and then that shifts their perspective because i know right. uh for me when i you know i i like to uh, make money off of timber or whatever just like the next landowner but when that turkey starts gobbling my exactly. priorities change so <laughs> uh, i'm just wondering it, is that relatively common with your uh with your landowners like the, that they get super excited when they start seeing big deer and hear turkeys gobble and maybe see a few cubbies of quail yeah absolutely they enjoy you know seeing the positive uh changes on a piece of property and you know 
it's kind of interesting too, because that's kind of where we come from is when we mm -hmm. typically first get on a piece of property, it's not very well managed, you know? Yeah. And so that's the enjoyment part of what we do is we could take pieces of property that are, um, that have issues and mm -hmm. try and fix them up, you know? Yeah. And, and that's actually very enjoyable to take a, uh, a property and try and optimize it as much as possible and fix it up and make a really nice piece out of it. We've got some that, you know, when you get out there and ride around and look and you're like, man, this place is nice, you know, mm -hmm. and it may not have the biggest, you know, prettiest house on it or something like that. But when you go through the woods, you know, they're burned and thinned and, mm -hmm. and, you know, landowners put money into gravel and roads and, you know, all weather terrain and stuff like that. Um, that's, you know, when they start seeing the results of doing good management, they tend to want to put a little bit more into it. And, yeah. um, you know, that's enjoyable to, to see a landowner, you know, really getting to enjoy his property more and more as things get better and better. Yeah. Well, there, there have been a couple of instances where, where I was working with landowners that, in a similar capacity. And it, it seemed like that kind of happened. Like at first, we, we care about both, you know, forestry and the, the wildlife. And then we start seeing things change. And then all of a sudden, they're a pyromaniac. Like they yeah. get some experience and start getting comfortable and, and they're seeing turkey poults running around and, and a few cubbies of quail. And the next thing you know, they're, they're watching the weather waiting for burn days. And, and that's what it is pretty funny. Fun. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny to see some of the landowners that are very leery to start with about fire and burning. They're scared of it. Yeah. And, you know, maybe three or four or five years down the road, they're out there, you know, telling all their friends about how great burning is. And, they, you know, they become a fire advocate yeah. um, because they've seen the results and they've realized maybe it's not, especially when we're doing it and not them. Mm -hmm. um, it's not nearly as scary. Yeah. And now we've got plenty of landowners that love to come and watch. And you yeah. say, you want to carry a drip torch? No, nah, I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm just going to let you guys do it. Yeah, you know, and because <laughs> you know, carrying a drip torch and lighting fire can be a little adrenaline rush. Sure, but uh, but they love to see the results. Well, uh, yeah, there's there's probably plenty of landowners out there that they they love to take advantage of the benefits, but they're not ready or or may never be ready to do right. it themselves. And, uh, yeah, and as many as you know acres as we have on our list every year we burn just the two of us are burning and we burn about ten thousand acres a year oh, wow. and and unfortunately very few of those acres are on you know let's say open quail woods or something like that where we can really you know capture a lot of acres in a single burn mm -hmm. most of it is mixed pine hardwood forest or heavily you know more heavily stocked piney woods and things like that some of which hadn't been burned very often and and you know maybe smaller blocks of a you know 50 or 100 acre burn block so you know it's a season full of burning and try and capture that many acres yeah and you know a lot of these uh landowners we encourage them to try and you know get involved in it mm -hmm. and i've got one landowner i mean i'm he's kind of a burner in training you know every time i burn he comes with me and you know i send him off with a drip torch and light that over there and i want you know try and get him as much experience as he can because ultimately i'd love him to burn his own place yeah and that way i can go burn somebody else's and i don't have sure. to mess with his and but you're right there's some of those landowners they're never going to do it um, mm -hmm. you know we had a had a client several years ago that always had terrible fire lanes and he did his own fire lanes and and with a either a disc or uh, usually a disc and um but they were narrow and they're rough and they had grass on them and pine straw on across them. he didn't do it very well and and but we weren't getting to him as quick as he wanted to one year and he was probably 60 at the time and um and he called me, say, you know, when are you going to come? I said, I don't know. In the next couple of days, we should be there. He said, I think I'm going to try and burn some myself. I got my son out here. And I said, all right, that's fine. Go for it. Have a good time. And I called him later that afternoon. And, and we had a pretty good burn day. And I and, uh, called him. And I said, how you doing? He said, oh, man. He said, I ain't never going to do this again. I said, well, is everything all right? He said, yeah, I, I think I got it all under control. But he's like, that head grass on these fire lanes burns like, burns like gasoline. <laughs> i've been telling you that for years and yeah. I, I can tell you this since then the fire lanes have been beautiful they've been yeah. messed up and they've been clean they've been just bare dirt you know mm -hmm. they've been wide and all of a sudden his his whole thing about what a, what a fire lane means changed yeah, yeah. Know, but he is he's never picked up drip torch again <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh that's really interesting but may not uh may have used that experience to to back off of burning but at least 
he realizes how important the good solid fire break is. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's a an important lesson in and of itself. Uh yeah, I, I've had some some situations where I, I I think this is what's happening. And I think it's something, especially for a species like turkeys and and quail certainly fit in that model as that uh mindset as well, where we need these landowners who are going to be the you know the connector i guess or whatever they call it in the the social sciences where they they're sort of becoming the the leader or or the the first one out of the gate so to speak and then starting to advocate and then that you know starts to expand the use of practices uh that that benefit the species at a larger scale and ultimately you know, th those are the kinds of efforts that are needed since I mean, what, you know, 90 plus percent in most of the southeastern states is privately owned land. Uh, you know, we, we have to have that kind of effort to start making landscape scale, uh, you know, population level effects for some of these species. Yeah, there's no doubt trying to capture a lot of acres. I mean, especially with the situation we're in, just like us, you know, we've got more acres to do than we really have the capability to, to do. Right. And there's not a whole lot of vendors out there, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to fill in. Um, we turn down folks and and, you know, trying to find new people that are that are burning that we can pass those those folks on to. Yeah. So would I, I know that uh, you guys have where you're saying that you've got more uh, more acres that you could burn than you are capable of doing that is what what's the. Uh, I guess what is driving that? Is it the the lack of vendors or an increasing interest in the use or some some uh I think it's a lack of vendors. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks around that that burn, but there's a lot of acres around that are needed to be burned. Yeah. And um so, you know, I don't I don't know which end of that, you know, stick is burning. Mm -hmm. Um it it could it could be both. It could be either. Sure. Um, but I do know that, you know, there's a limited number of people who, who are, are burning. I don't know if there's an increase in the number of acres in the state of Alabama that are being burned in any given mm -hmm. year. Um, I know with our client base that we've got other stuff. When we go through our burn list and try and, um, we try and keep it within, we try and keep it under 10,000 acres. And so there's a lot of stuff that we could be burning that we're like, eh, we can put that off till next year or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, and typically when we first develop our burn list for the year and let's say December or so, um, we know we're going to get phone calls from other guys that say, can you burn this? You know, what about this stand over here? So that that number is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And and right now we get people calling, you know, it's almost March. Burning season's already started. And they call and say, "Hey, can you burn this or that and the other?" Like now, it just it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the, you know, us as well, economies of scale make a big difference. Yeah. And so the landowner with a NRCS contract, the long leaf that was planted seven years ago that needs a second burn on it, uh, and it's a forty acre parcel, uh, it's just hard for us to justify getting to that. Mm -hmm. And I know I've talked to John McGuire quite a bit about that. And, you know, he's trying to find ways to fill that in and, and fill that gap that may cost that landowner a little bit more to get somebody to burn small acreage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have a hard time justifying it when we've got so many acres, uh, to, you know, that we just can't drive an hour to go burn, you know, a 20, 30 acre longleaf patch um, when we could be burning somewhere else and capture 200 acres for the day. Yeah. It's not necessarily about, you know, how much you're making on a given day. It's about how many acres you've got to get by the end of the burn season. Sure. You know? Well, and that, that, uh, that also is a good reason why, you know, getting landowners interested in doing some of it themselves, so they yep. could bite off those smaller pieces. And then for, you know, the, the uh, stands that are at scales in which they need help, it then right. frees you up to focus on, on uh, those larger scales. So, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So you, you, uh, you brought up something that I, I was curious if you, 
work with landowners on uh, with some of the the contracts that that are available to subsidize some of these efforts for people. Do we you, try and steer them in that direction. Yeah. Um, so the CSP and and uh, whip contracts, equip mm-hmm. things like that. Um, we try and um, steer them over to the NRCS or FSA or whoever's handling that uh, stuff in a given county. Sure. And um, and say, look, just you know, contact these folks. We'll send them the mm-hmm. maps. Here's what burning needs to be done. Of course, CSP is a more broad scale uh, program that covers a lot of different aspects. Mm-hmm. And so we'll develop a map form that says, here's a, a map of the different activities you could get under CSP. And, sure. and we'll send that into the NRCS and then let the landowner handle the application and the signatures and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, let them jump through the hoops because it's yeah. you know kind of complicated for us to try and jump through those hoops sure. uh, for multiple landowners. Um, so yeah, we try and we try and get, you know let them know that those uh, potential assists are out there mm-hmm. and available to them. So it's kind of my impression that a lot of people don't even know that 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 that, that exists the opportunity right. to to get some of you know some uh, payments potentially to to help defray the cost and sometimes exactly. all of the cost but uh a lot of times that's a you know part of the cost and I, I was is that your impression from the landowners that you know as, when you get new landowners or new clients uh, do they generally not know that those those opportunities Correct. Exist? I, I think the newer clients um don't know about those mostly mm-hmm. um obviously the clients we've had for a while are familiar with them and you know, again, it's economies of scale falls into this one as well. If they've got 20 acre replant on, you know, long way for something like that. A lot of times I'll just go, look, it's not worth the time and effort uh, mm-hmm. for a small, you know, burn contract. But if they've got some pretty good chunks of uh, acreage that can be pulled in under some type of uh, a cost share program, they're certainly wanting to do it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of landowners out there, especially newer landowners who might have just purchased a piece of property that have no clue. Uh, that those assist programs are out there. And yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, a good idea to kind of push that on on folks. Um, and, and again, some of them are pretty broad scale, you know, mm-hmm. some of the CSPs and stuff like that um, can be very helpful to, to a new landowner that wants to, yeah. you know, thin a pine stand and do some burning and do a little bit of herbicide work. All those things can be covered mm-hmm. uh, with some type of assist. You know. So, uh in terms of the ones where prescribed burning is is a part of the the assist, what what are the objectives of those programs? Like, what kind of general? I know that it, it, that it varies a lot by program and it even changes within a program. But just in general, what are what are they trying to accomplish with those programs? Just to give people an idea out there that that may this may be the first time they're hearing about it. Uh, like to formulate in their mind, is it even something that that they might be qualified to to get yeah i think the um uh i don't want to speak for the for the government agencies on what their objectives are on on these cost share programs for burning mm-hmm. they obviously mm-hmm. want to get more fire across the landscape there's no sure. question about that um and when it you know refines down to the individual burn block that somebody might be applying for the objectives are um could be one thing, could be, you know, three or four different objectives for that mm-hmm. particular burn block. Could be, you know, one of a benefit turkey habitat and fuel reduction and, you know, timber uh, management. Um, so, but I think the, the agencies understand that, you know, we're all going to benefit from a wildlife yeah. perspective, from an environmental perspective, habitat perspective across mm-hmm. the board, the more fire we can get on landscape. Um, and, you know, some of that, they'll I think there's a whole lot more burn acres that are out there that are not under a program than there is under mm-hmm. a program um and um uh but you know again when especially when you get in a smaller landowner base um those those programs can help them you know get started on it and we see a lot of change you know with our individual landowners as well on you know what why are they doing it what are they doing it for uh, mm-hmm. what's the objective of it um you know, if it all boils down to, to one thing on most of our landowner properties, uh, aesthetics is probably as big a objective as anything. Knowing that 
um, you know, we try and educate our landowners as much as we can on why this is beneficial to them. You know, deer, turkey, quail, you know, fox squirrels, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, fuel reduction, timber management. But you can box that pretty much all under one objective of, of aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And landowners want to have a pretty piece of property. Um, when they first start the process and start seeing a burn out there, um, uh, it's pretty normal for at least one or two of the members of the family or, you know, people that were involved in the property, uh, to see a fresh burn and, oh, that's black and it's ugly and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Um, give them a couple of years and all of a sudden they see, you know, pretty understories and, uh, nice vistas across their woods. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, man, this is pretty. And, you know, if there's anything we try and do on properties, it's just make them prettier. Yeah. And that increases property values, resale values, uh, sure. you know, everything else is to, is to get these properties prettier. And, and um, you know, that again, that may be under the objective of increasing turkey habitat, um, you know, nesting cover, quail habitat, deer, turkey, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the bottom line is it makes a place a lot prettier. Yeah. Well, that's nice. I, uh, I've had a couple of instances where that they sort I sort of saw that play out. Partic- one sticks out in my head where uh, the person was really, uh, she was a birder, I guess, uh, really passionate about seeing pretty birds. And uh, yep. it really was that kind of thing. We initially, there, there was a lot of thinning going on and it was kind of ugly and and uh then the burning started and they they were trying to basically uh return quail to their landscape right. uh that was their main objective and that was driving the decisions and at first it was definitely that there was some negativity because that you know at, right after the timber harvest and before the burning was getting done it was just wasn't very visually appealing but maybe three or four years into it after now we've accomplished a couple of burns and you're starting to see that flush of vegetation and a lot of pretty flowering plants that are colonizing and then all of a sudden the woods were colorful with a lot of different bird species that are associated with that that uh early successional structure exactly uh, the, the mindset completely changed and it was really awesome to watch that all of a sudden she was like, Oh, this is, this is beautiful. And I'm seeing all exactly. these birds that I wasn't seeing, you know, and uh, she was tracking that uh, uh, because she was so interested in it, but it was really fun to watch. And uh, I know we, we also had as part of that, uh, she had, she had actually enrolled in a, I want to say CP 44. It was a, the pollinator program for early succession uh-huh. and uh, yep. which is a fairly recent addition I think to uh, the the opportunities, but uh, she had created some early successional patches and man, the, the, uh, what was it? The uh, goldfinches uh-huh. one year it, it was, we, we went, we were driving by one of them and we flushed out of an acre patch. We probably flushed hundreds of those things out of oh, it. Really? It was just, it was just unbelievable because they're such an elaborate or ornate bird. Yep. It's just unbelievable to see that. And it's like, oh man. But as soon as she saw that, all of a sudden now these pollinator patches start, you know, these high quality early succession for a lot of folks that are listening to Turkey Week, exceptional poult rearing cover. Right. Uh, you know, it's having all these benefits that she was seeing. And it was really uh, something that was unexpected to her, you know. Yeah. So, well, there's a lot of ways to sell uh, uh, burning on a piece of property. And if you can find out again with the kind of landowner objectives and what their interests are, um, the bird thing has been something we've used quite a bit as well. Yeah. And especially when you tell folks, say, look, you know, these these uh, birds of the piney woods are, you know, mostly some of the more declining species of birds, yeah. in, certainly in the southeast, if not mm-hmm. the, the United States. And, um, you know, they're they're struggling to keep a foothold because of the habitat, you know, just in mm-hmm. there across the landscape. And um, doing all this kind of stuff will help them out. And yeah, people people like that stuff. Well, and I, I I can even appreciate it. You know, growing up, I I got into the my love for the outdoors and wildlife because of hunting. I mean, you know, I had yep. I had a a one track and maybe a two track mind where the turkeys 
and then deer you know I'd do that when we couldn't turkey hunt and when they weren't gobbling uh but you know loved both growing up but it, it, there's something to be said when you see the landscape transform into something that's more vibrant where all of these really cool species like you said a lot of them are of conservation concern and yep. the east a lot of those are associated with with early succession or open pine systems that are being burned frequently and they and they're not doing well because that's not as prevalent on the landscape and uh there's something to be said and i've even experienced it where all of a sudden those things return and the diversity increases and all of that stuff going on really it, it's a it's another type of aesthetic right that's super Absolutely. pleasing even to someone who may not have cared about that or didn't know they cared about it but then when it happens and you start right being a part of it it be starts becoming important you start to appreciate that aesthetic that comes with that and and uh, yeah it, it's just a part of the system functioning you know more yeah. like it should so really cool and uh you know uh, uh an experience that i can relate to even uh, exactly. seeing it happen so yeah it's fun to watch the properties transform it's fun to watch the people that uh, that are associated with those properties transform as well yeah i i, I think that's one of my favorite parts of my job is seeing that and I, I assume uh, based on what you're saying that's probably one of your favorite parts I, exactly. I also i kind of get to see that on multiple levels because i uh, advise a lot of graduate students and i get to see them go through their program and grow into you know a, a scientist that that they then go out and impact you know uh conservation and uh, exactly. that's, that's also another way that i sort of indirectly get to watch uh watch this kind of thing happen it's really really uh rewarding part of the work yes, uh absolutely. yeah getting the feedback from you know the the podcasts and the social media and people tag me a, a lot and hey i'm getting some burning done now and i get to see their fire and uh some before after pics and that sort of stuff man it really is yeah that what you're describing that really is a rewarding part of this is you get to see that and and see the light bulb turn on for people when they start exactly. doing it and get going and then they get super excited about how they have transformed their landscape for the better for all these species yeah and made, and made a lot of turkeys in the in the wake <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah so i guess uh i'd like to transition a little bit you you've got so much experience in so many different sectors and you and uh i think the majority of our listeners are private landowners that have an interest in, in fire what you know are there some things that you've learned over the years that that are really important for landowners like, like or maybe not necessarily take home messages but just things from your experience that that is valuable for people to know well you know again a lot of that depends i know that you know we're kind of in turkey week and so it mm. kind of leans towards the turkey side of things um well it doesn't have to be that, about turkeys but if you want sure. it to be we'll, we'll welcome of course, it. We, had, <laughs> we hadn't hit the turkeys that much but the um uh, you know landowner objectives um are going to drive that you know what's the most important on a piece of property so you know whether it's simple fuel reduction or you know a timber landscape where we can burn large blocks, a couple hundred acres in a block, or you're talking about quail management, you know, mm -hmm. I guess if there's a take home message, it's you got to tailor your burns to your objectives. And, sure. um, you know, relative to that, if you're doing, you know, quail management, um, you know, trying to average burn block size of 20 acres is probably where you need to be at. Mm -hmm. um, and for a guy like me um, that, you know, um, does it, um, as a consultant, um, when somebody comes to me and says, I got, you know, 120 acre burn blocks, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that, <laughs> you know, because it's a total yeah. pain um, versus, you know, a uh, couple hundred acres in one burn block. Yeah. Um, life's a lot easier that way. But, um, you know, again, relative to, to turkeys, for instance, in that same type of example, if you're trying to um you know tailor a, a burn block size for for quail and have you know a two year rotation you know you're burning whatever 40 percent minus the hardwood drains and stuff like that but 40 percent of your property on a given year 
in, um, in, in, you know, 40% this year, 40% next year and 20 year burn blocks, they got to be scattered randomly across landscape and burn next to unburned, that type of mm-hmm. thing. And the Turkey stuff is basically just, a um, an upscale of that. Um, turkeys have a much bigger home range. Sure. They, um, they're, you know, in my book, they're basically just a monstrous quail. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's some differences, but there's a lot of similarities. Sure. Their breeding system's a little bit different, but certainly the way they utilize the habitat is very similar. And mm-hmm. their, you know, nesting cover that they're searching for is basically just a larger scale, similar nesting cover. You know, quail might be looking for, you know, broom straw clump with a, a little bit of taller weeds or a small wax myrtle next to it. You know, turkeys are looking for uh, the same type of thing, but it, you know, might be a big, big bush. You sure. know, they like to nest under or something like that. So it's just a matter of scale of mm-hmm. difference. Um, you know, quail in the spring might have a you know twenty, thirty acre home range, and a turkey in the spring might have a two or three hundred acre home range. Mm-hmm. So you got to uh, tailor those things to each of the species. And I always say, yeah, I mean, you can mess up deer management, but deer management is you know, of course, all the, the, the deer biologists are going to be pissed off that I say easy this, <laughs> <laughs> but deer management's easy, you know, yeah. I mean, especially from a habitat standpoint. And mm-hmm. I always tell my landowners, look, the deer are going to come with you no matter where you go. Mm-hmm. The only problem you'll have is if you pave this place, yeah. you know, then you might, you might have to fence them to keep them in and feed them. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, you know, the, the deer, certainly in Alabama, where we're at, we got plenty of deer and basically any habitat management for turkeys and quail and squirrels and whatever uh the deer are pretty pretty comfortable with that mm-hmm. so but you can lose your turkeys pretty easy and you yeah. can certainly lose your quail really yeah. easy. most people um, are already don't have quail yeah. exactly exactly and i tell my deer turkey guys regularly i said look if we're managing this place correctly i should be seeing some quail on your place mm-hmm. if we don't we're not doing it right and, and they said, well i don't even quail hunt i, I, I don't really care you can tell me to, you know, that I can bring my bird dog down here and I'll quail hunt. Yeah. But you know, if you don't quail hunt, that doesn't matter. I want you to be able to every once in a while flush a cup of birds on your way to your deer stand. Mm-hmm. Um, because that indicates to me that I'm getting your habitat right and yeah. for your deer and turkeys. And um, so, you know, the the cautionary part of that from a um from management standpoint on a turkey thing is that especially on timber oriented properties, you got to be real careful about uh big block burning and um mm-hmm. uh, you know we typically tailor our our properties that are kind of focused from a turkey standpoint um uh, you know maximize our blocks of you know a couple hundred acres 200 acres maybe and and generally try and keep them you know closer to 100 acres mm-hmm. um because that allows complete utilization of that burn block it also you know gives you the ability to kind of juxtapose burned and unburned one year two year rough you know, mm-hmm. the type of, you know, rougher habitat of broom straw, piney woods, for instance, with some scattered shrubs on a three year rotation for turkeys a nest in that, you know, is a, is a three year rough mm-hmm. and next to a freshly burned block that, you know, turkey will want to uh, bring a brood to sure. and bug, you know, after mm-hmm. things green up. And it, it's the same with, uh, you know, season of burn. We try and rotate um mix it up a little bit you know yeah. this this might be burned in february that might be burned in may mm-hmm. um although we do tend to avoid the month of may because it's either you know the end of nesting and the first part of brood rear and mm-hmm. uh around here and 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 so we're cautious about we do a lot of uh uh grown season burns but we're cautious about burning during the month of may yeah and um we try and avoid cer- places. certainly on the big blocks for sure. Absolutely, you, know, you definitely are a, yep. even more cautious about the this you yep. know, with the large scale. And if we do burn in you know May and certainly June and July, um, it's typically those heavily stocked sweet gum understories mm-hmm. and um, that hadn't been burned in a little while. So we're trying to knock back bigger sweet gums, and that tends to be the places that turkeys probably are not nesting in. And, yeah. but if we've got a, uh, let's say a three year piney woods rough, a lot of broom straw and Indian grass, some scattered wax myrtle shrubs, things like that on it. Uh, landowner wants to burn in May, you know, I said, look, we'll do it, but I'm going to mm-hmm. caution you that this is the worst time you can do this particular block. You want to wait mm-hmm. for a month, this be perfect. 
yep. you know, if we did it a month before, that'd be perfect as well. But mm -hmm. um, when when you start uh, seeing those really high quality nest and cover blocks, um, you want to kind of avoid, you know, burning yeah. that, during that time frame. But but yeah, I mean, it's it's all about um, diversity and breaking up mm -hmm. a piece of property and and not only in timber stand types and ages, sizes. Um, you start talking hundreds of acres in a single pine stand, um, um, same age and same species mm -hmm. uh, with the same burn rotation. You know, it gets a little uh, monotonous and and um, you know homogenous. I think for for critters, yeah. and um, those are one of the things we try and look for too when we're starting to work on a piece of property is to break those up a little bit, and, sure, and kind of work towards a smaller block size, both in the burn and in the timber stands. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's interesting to to listen to you talk through that, and we we talk about a lot of these kinds of things all the time, obviously on the podcast. But uh, one thing that that I wanted to add to it that I think is really interesting, and and when I read this, it, it literally sent chills down my spine. Like the, I, I just couldn't believe. Uh, so folks that have been following us uh, when, when this is coming out, you know that I've been putting uh, some history of turkeys online uh, on uh, on Instagram. And uh, what I did was basically go through all these historical writings about turkeys. And I found some things that just blew me away. But the thing that sent chills down my spine is there were some some uh, some early writings from Bartram, who was one of the original explorers that drew some of the original maps of North America and oh, yeah. was mapping out vegetation structure and types and stuff like that and a lot of other things. And it was remarkably accurate. Uh, if you actually look at the place of things, it was pretty, pretty darn good given what he had to do that with. But yeah. uh, one of the things that really resonated with me is he was lamenting about not being able to sleep because there were turkeys gobbling right. in every direction all the time for hundreds of miles, exactly. he said. He's like, they, these turkeys won't let me sleep in the morning. And while he did, while, while he was lamenting about that and writing about it, I mean, first of all, man, I wish that were my problem. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> I couldn't kidding. sleep because all the turkeys got one. Uh, but the thing that resonated with me is while he was doing that, he was drawing a map that he then labeled the entire landscape nearly that that, that was the problem in. He labeled as Grande Savane, or in other yeah. words, Big Savannah. Exactly. So it, was a, it was open forest with very few trees, sparse trees by his definition, sparse trees with a herbaceous dominated understory, which essentially doesn't exist without frequent fire. Right. right. And in that landscape, and we're talking about 1700s, you know, uh, in that landscape, there were literally so many turkeys gobbling that he couldn't sleep. Yep. And it was irritating him. <laughs> yep. Yep. I've read that too. It's pretty fascinating. And I, yeah. he, he describes that from South Carolina all the way through uh, North Florida, Georgia, Alabama, yeah. uh, very similar situations where there's just abundant turkeys and open piney woods. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. And again, it was, you know, such a burn environment. Um, the uh, dogwood stand around Greenville, Alabama, that you've got mm -hmm. to imagine the turkeys were all over that of, of, uh, I forget how many miles he said they they rode under a canopy of dogwoods. Yeah, and uh, just, it was just hundreds of acres. You know? Yeah, and uh, all fire tolerant species. Mm -hmm. you know? Kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, it is amazing to think about how much that's changed, but also just wow. Can you imagine a landscape where you have nearly as many turkeys as you have trees? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like they're they're sitting on top of each other on the limbs. That, that's they probably a, were it's kind of like being out <laughs> west in the cottonwood tree the only yeah. tree in the prairie you know it's got 20 turkeys in. yeah well that <laughs> yeah seems like that might have been what it looked like back in those days around here in the right. southeast but uh yeah it's just going through that you know they're so poetic with the way they write things but yeah uh, it was just amazing to think about how much the landscape has tr transformed why a lot of the species like you brought up earlier a lot of those species are you know, we're concerned about them and uh, we see them return when you start making these transformations in the landscape. Exactly. And it's, 
that has a lot of value, just intrinsic value with it. But uh, yeah, it's just amazing to think that that's why a lot of that landscape no longer exists, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, it's kind of work through, certainly it'd be nice to work through with Bartram and mm-hmm. really kind of find out what, um, it's, a lot of their descriptions are hard to, for us to understand. Yeah. And of course, I wouldn't have pictures, you know, mm-hmm. and so um, there's there's a lot of things that I've, when I've read through and I've read a couple of different books about his travels of, um, you know, there's a lot of post oak savannas and things like that mm-hmm. that they came across, you know, and that component I would love to know more about, you know, yeah. how extensive were these bottoms, were all these bottoms, obviously they were burned through, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, you know, the hardwood component that was involved in longleaf pine forest. Um, on the uplands that was, you know, from Texas to North Carolina. Yeah. Um, you know, how did all that work? I mean, I, I, and um, uh, American chestnut, you know, mm-hmm. where did, how far down did that come? Where did that play a, a part yeah. in our Southeastern environment back then? You know, yeah. Um, well, there's just uh, lots of, lots of yeah. questions I'd like to know more about. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, we had, you know, uh, there was a recent paper that came out that showed that uh, American chestnut of all the, I don't remember how many tree species they looked at the flammability of the leaves of uh-huh. all of these different tree species to include several pine species and the most flammable one was chestnut Interesting. and i was just like that that kind of blew me away it was like wait yeah. a minute it, it's more flammable than some of the pine needles were yeah was, and i mean was, there's some uh yeah, even south of the black belt uh here in alabama there's some uh chestnut old chestnut buildings yeah um and you know they didn't bring it down to tennessee yeah, you know, so there was, well, there enough, was enough chestnut around here to, yeah. to build homes with. And some of the you know, and some of the history history of that species indicate it may have been one of the most common trees across the east, right. or at least yeah. the eastern hardwoods or su- southern Appalachians. Yeah, especially, and, exactly, yeah. especially Piedmont and above. Yeah, and the, you know the productivity of that. How did that relate to turkeys and things like that? that yeah. You know, historically, I mean, yeah. I was just we were literally my partner and I were on burn yesterday afternoon. And going, man, wouldn't it be great to just spend like oh two weeks of getting shifted back to like you know sixteen seventeen hundred, and and you know just take a quick look around for about two weeks, just kind of yeah. visit, and, and then yeah, come on back. Like, oh, and yeah. I lived there forever. You know, yeah. it's pretty rough life. It's, it sounds really romantic when you read a book <laughs> until yeah. you you know we're actually there and you're like, yeah, this yeah, it's a hard not life. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> we well, would never survive. Yeah, another thing that when I have been going through that, that blew me away, just talking about how much things have changed and how different it must have been there. Have you ever read anything about the passenger pigeon? Which is oh, yeah. the, in the early 1800s, there's billions. And then uh, about yep. 1900, there were none or a little after 1900, early 1900s. Yep. Uh, and there were writings about it taking weeks for a single flock to fly over. And yep. the, the light, like the sunlight was blocked out blocked yeah. because of that and the temperature underneath the flocks was lower than you know, it was just all these crazy well, and their, their roost sites they would go shovel guano out from under their roost sites and use it as fertilizer yeah there's literally you know, it, writings of it being feet of poo right <laughs> right and they're, like they're, they're nesting the you know their nesting areas they were communal nesters and mm-hmm. and uh you know there would be hundreds of maybe not hundreds of acres, but certainly tens of acres of solid, you know, uh, pasture pigeons nested in every bush and tree. Yeah. And uh, they'd send kids scampering up the branches and, you know, collecting squabs and eggs and mm. everything else. I mean, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. And the, the reliance of that species apparently on chestnut, um, I don't know whether deer had to bust them up or what, but they, they <laughs> said they were heavily reliant on, on chestnuts mm. as well. Yeah. So, well, it's just, yeah. Yeah, it's really telling to think through that. And, and a lot of people that are listening to this may not have knew any of that or have read about that, but I encourage you to to think about those things. It, it certainly is important to understand why we want to do a lot of these practices, exactly. what, what we're trying to mimic and why we see this big response from so many species. You know, that those were the kinds of conditions that they grew up in, so to speak, you know, yeah. based on. A yeah, lot we'll of, never get it back. Um, but we can do our best to try and fix it up you sure. know, while we're here and uh, we're not going to mimic what it used to be, but um, you know, yeah, I think doing, doing the kind of things we do and mm-hmm. uh, environmental management burning and, you know, 
trying to open your stands up and benefit different species of critters um, is all, you know, an assist anyway. Yeah. I, I think you're right. We can look back and learn from that and use it to, to be good stewards now. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, uh, is there anything else that you, like any take home messages or anything you'd like for, for people to, to take with them? Well, you know, I mean, probably only two, um, uh, one, you know, the more burning you know, any burn is better than no burning, mm-hmm. um, season wise, size wise, whatever. I think, you know, any burn is better than no burning and two, um, either ha- hire a professional or have a lot of experience when you do it. Yeah. It is a dangerous sport. It's entertaining. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite things to do. I don't really, I mean, we do a lot of timber management dealing with, you know, timber management stuff is really frustrating nowadays mm-hmm. for, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, herbicide work and spraying is, I mean, it's something you got to do, but it's not that entertaining. Um, uh, burning is fun. Burning is also, um, goes, it's kind of like being in the military, I guess, you know, you go from being bored to, you know, a massive <laughs> adrenaline rush, mm-hmm. um, because watching a fire is probably one of my favorite things to do. And I tell folks all the time, I love lighting these things. I absolutely hate putting them out. <laughs> and, and, you know, if I get through a day of burning and I don't have to put one out pretty dang happy. Yeah. Um, and it's been a good day, but when you've got to pull one out, especially one on a windy day and it's running, um, and you just think, why do I do this? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's just a matter of being careful and either like say hired or you know, a professional or being with one a lot, like say our clients, we, the ones that want to burn are coming with us on a pretty regular yep. basis. And we're trying to get them some hours, uh, with a drip torch in their hand to kind of see, um, I've been doing this since 85, 84. And, um, uh, and I still learn mm-hmm. things on burns, you know, yeah. um, they're, every fire is different and, and there's always something you can pick up and learn from it. Sure. Yeah. Very good points. Well, um, I know that you, you have plenty to do. I appreciate you taking the time. If folks have uh, follow-up questions for you or they want to reach out to you, how, how can they get in touch with you? Probably the easiest way is our, we got a website, uh, uh, okay. www.bachandevos.com b-a-c-h-a-n-d-d-e-v-o-s.com mm-hmm. um, that's our website we've got contact information on there you okay. know my phone number's on there if anybody wants to call yeah. we'll, um, we'll put links and, to to the website for folks in okay. our show notes so that you can just click yeah. on that if you're if you're interested as long as they don't call asking for any more burning <laughs> well don't deter them you know <laughs> yeah we will uh, we'll pass them on to somebody hopefully that will be able to we'll, we'll pick them. up slack yeah yeah absolutely okay well uh like i said i know you have plenty to get to it sounds like you got plenty of burning to do so uh thank you for taking the time it's been really fun talking to you about this absolutely likewise enjoyed it yeah all right folks thanks for listening uh be sure to go check out their website we'll have it linked for you and also uh, if you're interested in some of this history and you haven't seen it uh we're posting it on social media uh, at, at Dr. Disturbance in particular, uh, we're posting a lot of this content so you can see some of those historical writings. So I encourage you to go check that out. But until next time, thanks for listening. Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.